Hello, South Lake family. Uh, it's an honor to be with you yet again um, for this chapel service. I pray that you are finishing the semester well. You're looking forward to some rest next week. We talked about being intentional with our time um, last time we were together. And I just really hope that you were able to put that into practice. Um, so this time that we're together, I want to talk to you about a character from the Bible who has a little bit of a colored past. Um, before we get into that, though, I would like to pray for us. So if you would pray with me. Gracious Father, God, I thank you for who you are, what you've done for us, what you will do for us. God, I pray in this time that we have together that we're able to draw nearer to you Lord, speak to us. Use your word to be a lamp unto our feet and guide us. God, I thank you for this message that you've given me, and I pray that I convey it well. In your son's name I pray. Amen. So I want to talk to you about um, a guy. He is an adulterer. He is a murderer. He is a musician. He is a man after God's own heart. Now, I'm sure that does not sound like someone that you would attribute a person that would be after God's own heart. You see, this man, when he was eight years old, or no, he was 12, I'm sorry. He was the eighth son, but he was about 12 years old. This holy man came to his house and said, one of you will be king. And his dad overlooked him. And said, you know, oh, surely it's one of my my seven sons. But the prophet would not stand for that. And he said, in fact, haven't you another son? Because none of these are the Lord's chosen. And this man that I'm talking about, his name is David. So David, at 12 years old, just out being a shepherd, which was like the lowest job you could possibly have. Um, you know, he's just out watching the flock and... This holy man of God shows up to this house and changes his life forever that day and calls him into the house um, and says, surely this is the one that the Lord has anointed. He anoints him with oil. So he says to him, basically, you're going to be a king one day. And I can only imagine the excitement 12-year-old Nathan would want. Right? He'd be like, yes, I get to be king. Um, but he wasn't king immediately. He went back out to be a shepherd after that. And in fact, it took a long time between being anointed and becoming king. Um, David's name actually means beloved. And I love that about it because when I said, when I opened this and I told you that he was a murderer and an adulterer and after God's own heart, God still loved him through all his flaws. And we're going to talk about something today that I think is why. He was still after God's own heart. And the word I'm going to use is consistency. Now, I want you to understand consistency in context, all right? David had a lot of consistency with small portions of his life that were inconsistent. So as I said before, he was a shepherd um, just out watching his flocks. You know, um, one day his dad said to him, hey, your brothers are at war. You need to go and check on your brothers. I'm sure everyone's heard this story. So David goes and he checks on his brothers. And when he shows up, there's this really, really large man standing out in the valley. And he's shouting out to the Israelites, challenging them, disgracing them, talking poorly about their God. And it's in um, it's in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm not going to read it to you. But I want you to know that David says, surely no one should run from this man if you have faith, God will make you prevail. Um, so David was offended that this, this Philistine was able to just run his mouth and just disgrace them so much. And he says, I may just be a boy. He's probably about 14 or 15 now. I may just be a boy, but I'm going to go get him. And he does. And he goes and he slays a giant. Everyone knows this story. It's one of the most popular stories, whether you're a Christian or not. You've heard of David and Goliath. And what I want you to get from that is a couple of things. 
the king asked him, how do you know that you're going to be victorious? Because David had this, this fire about him. Like he had this certainty that he was going to slay the king. And David, you know, he says, well, when I was a shepherd and I was watching over the flock, um, I was able to slay a bear and slay a lion and protect the sheep. And so my God protected me then. Why would my God not protect me now? And that is a really, really cool place to be at such a young age, to understand that God has gotten him through some very difficult times in his life. And I know you're not slaying bears and you're not slaying lions right now, but I will say that you're going through a very difficult time. And I want to encourage you that you will get through this difficult time. What got David through that time was being able to rely on his past experiences and knowing that God was there for him and was providing for him. So he was consistent in his faith. He said, he's never failed me yet. Why would he start now? Now, do you think when he was fighting the bear, he kind of questioned like, where are you, God? Why is this happening? What's going on? Absolutely. But he didn't stop fighting and he didn't just... He didn't just say, oh, well, God must not be real or God must not be there. He had faith in the situation. And I would so encourage you to do that today. Please put that into practice. Please know that God is there for you. God does love you. If he took care of David, he's going to take care of you thousands of years later. So moving on with David, he defends against his country or defends um, against Goliath? Sorry, I'm stuttering over that. He defends against Goliath for his country and for his God because he knew that someone had to stand up for his God. So later on, he gets to go and be in the king's court. Um, the king had some, it said, uh, bad spirits and he would get headaches and everything kind of annoyed him and, you know, he couldn't really do anything. And David was a musician. He played the lyre or the leer, and he was able to play that, and it would soothe the king when he was having episodes. So he would play for the king, and the king liked that for a while. And then, you know, David was also, remember the Goliath story, he was also a warrior too. So as he's growing up, he was going out, and he was fighting, and he got a name for himself, and that made the king jealous. And so the king plotted and says, I'm going to kill David. And he tried several different ways, definitely, different methods to kill him, but he never was successful. And to one point where David was on the run from the king, he was out in the wilderness. He was by himself. He was staying in caves. He was staying in lots of places. He actually had an opportunity to even kill the king, but he chose not to. And the reason he didn't is because he said, who am I to kill the Lord's anointed? So he recognized that God had chosen Saul to be the king. So who was he to do that? Now, I can't imagine someone wanting to kill me and be me retaliating with love or like, nah, God chose him, you know, but, but David was able to. So what I want you to see is he was consistently a servant or consistently concerned with God's purpose. And this does him well. So I've told you about the good. He later goes on and he does replace Saul. He does become king. Now, when he becomes king is where you will see some inconsistencies or some discrepancies in his conviction towards the Lord. Um, when he becomes the king, everything kind of goes okay in the beginning. You know, he uh, he goes back and he conquers um, the Jebusites that were in Jerusalem and, and he... He brings the Ark of the Covenant back, and there's a he acts crazy because he's so excited that the Ark is there, and his wife is like, I can't believe you acted like that. She's embarrassed by him. David Crowder wrote a song about it, and you can listen to it if you want. Um, but he was really, really excited for the Lord. Somewhere, something happened. One night, David was out looking around and he saw an attractive woman and he decided he could not live without her and he had to have her. So everyone knew that this woman was married, but he wanted her anyway. 
committed adultery with her. Then he tried to cover up his sin by having her husband killed. And eventually he is killed in battle because David sent him to the front lines. And that's Bathsheba and Uriah. So David, he starts to kind of stray. He kind of strays away. But later on, he comes back. What I like about David and what I like about this story that I'm telling you now is David starts out very well. He starts to get older, starts to get older, kind of goes a little bit of the wrong way. And then he realizes, gosh, I am not doing right by God. I have got to come back to the Lord. And eventually, after kind of his last debacle where he takes a census and he wasn't supposed to because he wanted to know how powerful he was, he makes his way back to God. Now, if you or I were in God's situation, would you welcome him back? Would you be like, oh, yeah, that's fine, completely fine. Come on back. I think we would have more reservations than God probably did. See, the really cool thing about God is he loves you, all of you. He loves your good. He loves your bad. He wishes you wouldn't do it, but he loves you anyway, despite your your flaws. He loves you through your flaws. And he waits for you to want him back because he always wants you. And David, I don't know if he consciously knew that or not. I don't know if he consciously thought, well, I can always go back to God. And some Christians get caught in this trap where they're like, okay, well, I can just do whatever I want, and then I'll say I'm sorry. No, there was a true repentance in David's heart. He truly, truly wanted to go back to God and to serve him. And that's what he did. It's what he does with his life. So just a small recap of David. He was anointed King Young. He slays Goliath. He overtook the Jebusites or, and conquered Jerusalem. He brought the ark back. Then he's attributed to writing 77 of 150 psalms. So he's over half of the psalms he wrote. And a lot of the psalms are like love songs to God. And he's just pouring his heart out to God. And I think it's such a beautiful sight to see someone as broken as bad as whatever adjective you want to insert about him there. Being so just uninhibited with his possibility of coming back to God and returning to his faith. See, he was consistent with his faith. And I got to tell you, that came with practice. He had to put his faith into practice every single day. So even when he walked away or even when he did things that he knew God would not necessarily want him to do, when he came back, he was able to know why that was wrong and make adjustments to not do that again. You see, repent actually means to turn around. So he was going the wrong direction and he repented. And so he turned around and come back to God. So guys, right now, more than ever, we need to be consistent with our faith. We've got to make time for them. We've got to make them a priority. And we have got to just live our life. I, I, I always say, like, I used to always say, I want to live my life in a manner that puts a smile on God's face. And if you can do that every single day, I can promise you, that you will fulfill the covenant of the Lord, which is to be blessed and be a blessing. So guys, that's all the time we have for today. And I really hope that you were blessed by this message. I know I surely was. I want to leave you with this. I love you. Your teachers love you. Our entire faculty loves you. We want nothing but the best for you. So whether you are going through a troublesome time right now or a really good time, Please know that you are loved by us and by God. See you next time.